Um, it is a difficult task not to, to oppose some of the principles that we all, in, um, in our all intentions, we come to hospitals every day to treat patients, and then you come and discuss why not to treat a patient. But let's look at um, the issue from a broader perspective. Um, some patients are, we are talking about unruptured aneurysms, so it is a controversy that will still linger for a long time. On autopsy studies and um, epidemiological studies, they are not rare, they are there, 1 to 2 percent of any population. And as mentioned before, the subarachnoid hemorrhage, if it happens, it carries at best a 30 percent mortality rate. We all harp on the size because of the, of the um, elegant statistics from international studies, and everyone looks at it to try to simplify it to a number where you can decide and dichotomize your patients to treatment or no treatment. Now, the issue was statistics said seven. People are all around the world look at five as being the one to treat, but we are still missing a lot. Now, uh, in 2008, I presented in, in the Saudi critical care meeting about subarachnoid hemorrhage, and I used this slide because what we know that um, subarachnoid hemorrhage constitutes 6 to 10 percent of all strokes, but we didn't have any statistics in Saudi Arabia at the time. And I used the, the line, we need to do more work, because we did quote the work was done in the 90s uh, by uh, Dr. Ammar and Dr. Saad al -Rajah and others, but we moved along. Dr. Yasser Orz and Dr. Yamani did publish the impact of size and location uh, in, of ruptured aneurysms, denoting that the Saudi population carries a smaller risk for small, uh, a, a, a rupture risk for smaller aneurysms. Now, we looked at uh, that the same subject with Dr. Basim Sheikh, and we came to the same conclusion that a lot of the ruptured aneurysms in Saudi Arabia are small aneurysms. So is it fair that we just stick to the international statistics and apply that to a population that is not having the same genetic or environmental predispositions? To dig that in that deeper and just look at something other than size, you look at the hemodynamics. <clears throat> the more red, and I mean, we're used to black or white or shades of gray, and in some uh, CT machines, you can have the color red artificially pointed there. But if you look at the flow dynamics and the shear wall stress, you will realize that this artery is different than this one. The red is high pressure, blue is low pressure, green is moderate pressure. So if this aneurysm is, if this patient or this person, he's not a patient and yet, will form an aneurysm, intuitively this patient will form, this person will form an aneurysm here, an aneurysm here, and something in the posterior circulation. Look at it in a different way. You have a large aneurysm, which by statistics you have to treat. You look at it, it's all within the blue range. This, on the other hand, makes sense because it's an irregular aneurysm and it has red in it, so there is a lot of stress in the wall. We look at the wall again. If someone sees this aneurysm, will probably, probably run to the OR or to the endovascular treatment because it's a large aneurysm, but it's all blue. Now you look at this one. This actually is smaller, but has higher pressure. So size is not the only factor that we can decide on. This is a summary of all the risk factors that we can and consider when we're making a decision before dismissing a patient and not treating them. Now, when you look at this, large aneurysms, large unruptured aneurysms, we refuted that because we can say in our population that smaller aneurysms should be considered for treatment. Previous subarachnoid hemorrhage, someone who has four aneurysms, one of them ruptured, the others become high risk. That's intuition. Location is eloquent, eloquently said before, so I'm not going to repeat it, but morphological aspects. Size is something, but the angulation to the parent vessel and irregularity in the wall, the uh, undulation index, or the size ratio, a five millimeter aneurysm on a three millimeter vessel 
is completely different than a 5 millimeter aneurysm on a 6 millimeter vessel. So we have to take that into consideration when we're talking about aneurysms. And the most important thing, you have to look at your patient. Is he a smoker? Did they have a family history? And so on. Are they going to comply with the treatment that we're going to offer them in terms of long-term antiplatelets, for example? So all these are factors to consider. But as uh, Dr. Kurdi said, out of his vast experience, keeping things simple is the safest way to go. Like this aneurysm, you can go surgical, you can go and do a lot of fancy things, but a simple coiling will do, especially that the patient is unruptured. You don't need to cause more harm. You can do crazy things like this with dual balloons and all that, but that is not what we want to achieve. We want to achieve maximum safe treatment for these aneurysms if we decide to treat them. Now, Dr. Kurdi alluded a little bit to the flow diverters, but also along the flow, uh, flow dynamics, we think that we treat the aneurysm by flow diversion. But look at this aneurysm here. This is one stent and this is another stent. And you can see that the, the pressure in the wall goes to the artery. So you eliminate the pressure within the sac, but in two different stent placements, you can see that there's still some pressure on this one. And in the second placement for the other stent, there is less pressure and less pressure here. So what does that tell you? Flow diversion is not the answer to everything. And we are seeing more and more of the long-term results that sometimes can be discouraging. So if you're faced with a patient who does not have a realistic risk for rupture, then you probably would observe this patient and see if the aneurysm is changing behavior with time, rather than just harping on the size and the location and what you can do and offer today. New approaches are coming. So flow diversion is one thing, and endovascular, like intrasacular treatment to allow the endothelialization, because one of the problems with the coils is that and the stents that the endothelial uh, endothelium does not seal all the way, so there is need for antiplatelets, for example, or risk for recanalization. But this design allows the endothelium to jump from one strand to the other and bridge the lumen of the, of the neck of the aneurysm and excludes it. Another neat way of doing it is when we understand and we look at the patient and not the aneurysm, is to look at the, the genetics of formation of aneurysms and progression of aneurysms and rupture of aneurysms. If you can identify these genetic players, you can actually reverse them by decoy RNA modulation, and you can identify whatever risk factor, whatever risk, uh, risky genetics for this particular patient, and you can reverse them. And either you hold the progress of this aneurysm or uh, help regress it with time. And that is actually in the literature, and it's becoming a reality, not a science fiction anymore. So, recommendations. We still have to be very careful when deciding not to treat a patient. If you are deciding not to treat the patient, you are allowed, but you have to make sure that the patient is compliant with the recommendation to improve their lifestyle, not to smoke and not to do anything crazy, and also that they, you can ensure that they follow up with you if you want to, if you, if you decide, because here, again, I agree with uh, Dr. Kurdi, the difficult, difficulty in this that the patient cannot decide with all this um, science that we're giving them. So if we decide for the patient that we don't want to treat them, we have to make sure that they are nearby and they can follow up every year and we can see the progress of their aneurysms and ensure their safety at all times. Thank you very much.